I do want to shift gears and talk a little bit about osteoporosis. So magnesium also plays a role in bone health. We already discussed how roughly 60% of the body's magnesium is stored in the bones. It serves as a reservoir during times um, when you need magnesium. Your body will pull it from your bones to, to, to get that source of magnesium. As a person ages, magnesium losses from the bones increase. And this is partly because the body strives to maintain a very narrow, stable range of magnesium in the plasma. When our dietary intake is insufficient, the body compensates again by pulling magnesium from the bones, which is a reservoir. I know I'm being repetitive here, but it's important to understand that. Just like the muscle is a reservoir for amino acids, our body pulls amino acids out of muscle when we need to get when we need amino acids and when we're low on protein, which is not a good thing because then you end up losing muscle mass. Well, the same concept here. Your body is pulling magnesium from your bones. That's a reservoir for magnesium, but pulling from the bones, especially when you're talking about over a lifetime, right? You're talking about in older adults, this can contribute to a decrease in a very large decrease in bone magnesium content. In fact, over a lifetime, nearly half of the magnesium content of bone is lost in people. And and there's some evidence that suggests that this magnesium loss in the bones over decades contributes to osteoporosis. So ad- adequate magnesium intake early in life really honestly is like an investment in your long-term bone health, right? Because if you are getting enough magnesium from your diet and supplemental sources, your body's not going to have to pull on the magnesium from your bones to get it what it needs. So studies have shown that magnesium-rich diets in pre-adolescence uh, positively uh, positively um, affect bone density in young adulthood, um, particularly in the heel bone. There's been a year-long magnesium supplementation study that found that magnesium supplementation for one year can enhance bone mass in the hips of peripubal uh, girls. And I think this highlights, again, um, magnesium's crucial role beyond just calcium, in building strong bones and preventing osteoporosis. A lot of people think about the role of calcium, also very important for bone health. But getting enough magnesium early in life is, I think, really important. So I'm not talking about supplementing with magnesium later in life when you already have osteoporosis. I'm talking about preventing your body from pulling that magnesium out of your bones so that you don't you're not going to get, so that you you lower your risk of osteoporosis later in life. Um, So, you know, magnesium is important for ensuring stronger bones as you age. And I think, again, think of it as an investment strategy earlier in life. You're you're going to make sure that your body's not going to pull that magnesium from your bones year after year after year after decade after decade, eventually depleting, you know, 40% of your your body's uh, bones, you know, reservoir of magnesium. I think on a very similar note, let's get into vitamin D and vitamin D metabolism. Vitamin D also plays a role in bone health, but I think even more important here is the role magnesium plays in vitamin D metabolism. So it's just another layer of, you know, connection that magnesium has to our bone health because we know vitamin D plays a role in bone health as well. So vitamin D is important for calcium absorption and bone health. Magnesium, by acting as a cofactor for several enzymes that metabolize vitamin D, then helps make sure that we're getting vitamin D and using it effectively. Magnesium directly contributes to bone density because it's it makes up the bone, right? So it, but it also plays an important role in bone health indirectly by contributing to vitamin D met- metabolism, which is a key player in bone health. So the synergy between magnesium and vitamin D metabolism, I think, is a perfect example of how interconnected our nutrient intake is with you know, overall bodily functions and how some of these micronutrients are sort of working together and synergizing and why some trials where you're just giving one micronutrient may not be enough because another one is needed because they work in concert. So let's discuss this a little bit. High intake of magnesium, whether from the diet or supplements or both, 
is linked to a lower risk of having low levels of vitamin D. There's also a notable interaction between magnesium and vitamin D intakes that influence the risk of vitamin D deficiency and insufficiency. So what do I mean? For example, if a person's magnesium intake is adequate, this can enhance the body's ability to maintain healthy levels of vitamin D. On the other hand, if magnesium intake is low, like 45% or half the population roughly of the U.S., that may hinder the body's ability to utilize vitamin D effectively, even if vitamin D intake is sufficient. So this study found that the benefits of having higher vitamin D levels in reducing the risk of death, um, especially from cardiovascular disease and col colorectal cancer, were more significant in individuals that had above average intake of magnesium. Building on the insights of those observational studies I just mentioned, a randomized controlled trial helped shed further light on how magnesium supplementation influences vitamin D status. So magnesium is key for enzymes that convert vitamin D3 into 25-hydroxyvitamin D, which is the main circulating form of vitamin D in our bodies. It's what we typically measure on a vitamin D blood test. So this tri trial showed that for people with low 25-hydroxyvitamin D levels, which usually can indicate vitamin D deficiency, magnesium supplementation effectively increase these levels. It appears that magnesium is aiding in the conversion of vitamin D3 into this more stable form of vitamin D, which is 25-hydroxyvitamin D. So what this tells us is that magnesium's influence on vitamin D status is not a one-size-fits-all. It really varies based on your existing vitamin D levels. It's playing a critical role in either helping stabilize vitamin D in the body, converting that vitamin D3 into that active, that, that stable circulating form, or it's also activating that, cir that circulating stabilized form, 25-hydroxyvitamin D, into the active steroid hormone, depending on your individual needs. I think this study really... I like this study. It offers a deeper understanding of like the intricate relationship between magnesium and vitamin D. They're both crucial micronutrients, although vitamin D actually functions as a steroid hormone in the body. But it also adds layers of complication to randomized controlled trials using vitamin D. And perhaps there's a negative result where you're getting no effect after giving a vitamin D supplement. Well, if half the US population is not getting enough magnesium, and magnesium is required to make vitamin D function as an active steroid hormone, then you're going to have a problem. Those trials are, they're going to be flawed at the get-go. And again, it, it just, it, it highlights the important role of thinking about nutrition differently than pharmaceutical drug trials. We have to think about not only the, the varying levels and, and, and different levels people have of these nutrients at the start of the trial, but how these nutrients are interacting with each other. And if a deficiency in one is gonna affect the function of another, then giving that supplement of the other isn't gonna do much if you're still deficient in the important micronutrient that is needed to make that other one properly function. So again, um, I, I, just, I, I just want you guys to understand why nutritional trials are so complicated and why there's so much to mix data out there. It's, it's just, it's incredibly hard to design the trial properly and to think of all these things um, and to get enough funding to do them as well. So um, lots of things to keep in mind when it comes to interpreting the results of a trial. Okay, let's shift gears and talk now about blood pressure, hypertension, the role of magnesium in lowering blood pressure. So hypertension or high blood pressure it's actually a pretty prevalent issue. So it affects nearly half of U.S. adults, including 20% of young adults age 18 to 39, which, wow, that's kind of important. 20% of young adults age 18 to 39 have hypertension. It's, it's really crucial for people, those young adults, people in their 20s and 30s, to be aware of their blood pressure. Elevated blood pressure is not only going to increase the risk of cardiovascular diseases, but it also significantly raises the risk of dementia later in life. And what's the most important factor for that is the cumulative exposure to high blood pressure. So the earlier in life you get high blood pressure, the more the, the risk you have of dementia later in life. 
And this is because sustained high blood pressure can lead to damage in the small vessels of the brain, and that impairs cognitive functions and potentially leads to conditions like dementia as a person ages. So monitoring and managing blood pressure from a young age, I think, is a really important and can be crucial for mitigating these dementia risks, these cardiovascular disease risk. So where does magnesium come into this? Well, magnesium helps control blood pressure by boosting the production of substances like prostacyclin and nitric oxide, which relax blood vessels and improve overall cardiovascular health. It also aids in the widening of blood vessels, which reduces blood pressure, so vasodilation. It makes it easier for the heart to pump blood. Also, magnesium's ability to fight inflammation and protect against damage to blood vessels also is another way that it can support cardiovascular health. And I think this shows, you know, there's a lot of different ways that magnesium plays a vital role in helping maintain and keep the cardiovascular system healthy. So there was a comprehensive meta-analysis involving 34 different randomized controlled trials. There was over 2,000 participants, and researchers discovered that magnesium supplementation at an average dose of 368 milligrams per day notably lowers both systolic and diastolic blood pressures. This effect, which is slightly influenced by the dose and duration of magnesium, I think does underscore the potential for magnesium to play a role in blood pressure management, perhaps in some people. There are laboratory studies that also back this up that have found magnesium ability, magnesium's ability to adjust vascular smooth muscle function. It, it can reduce vac, uh, vascular resistance. It can combat hypertension, prevent vasoconstriction. Also, it, it's been shown to have antioxidant properties in the vascular system. I think all these things um, help mitigate vascular damage caused by oxidative stress and, and other factors as well. And I think this latest research, including um, a comprehensive meta-analysis, really does, a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, really does highlight that magnesium may could play a role in help managing blood pressure effectively in some people. Also, integrating you know magnesium-rich foods into the diet also is an important way as well. And there's been a lot of studies out there showing things like a DASH diet, which are which include a lot of foods that are rich in magnesium, is an, another great way to manage hypertension or high blood pressure as well.